I have an immense respect for public interest lawyers, people who devote their professional careers to doing the right thing and helping people. And among other things, environmental law, civil rights matters, and the like. Bickle and Brewer is not a public interest law firm. We do predominantly commercial litigation, trial work for businesses, entrepreneurs. But we told ourselves years ago that, you know, you have something when you're a lawyer, and it's fairly incredible. It's called the power of <coughs> bar card. And what you can do as a licensed lawyer in your state, no matter what you do during the daylight hours, you have an ability to make a difference. We formed about a decade ago the Bitcoin Brewer Storefront, which is a subsidiary, if you will, of our law firm that does public interest work. Through the years, we've done things like we represented the wheelchair athletes in the New York Marathon, and we're able to get the marathon opened up to uh, wheelchair athletes uh, so they weren't diverted, like in the years past, over to the side and told to stop while the so-called able-bodied uh, marathon runners completed their marathon. We had opportunities like that, but we had a unique opportunity come along uh, in our backyard. Our home office is in Dallas, Texas, and we have a uh, major office here in New York as well. And this past couple of months, I think, marks the fifth anniversary of the Bitcoin Brewer Storefront's fight against the city of Farmers Branch, Texas, and it has been quite a fight at that. A little bit of background. Farmers Branch is a not-too-affluent but certainly middle class, older suburb of Dallas. Population approximately 30,000 people. As Foster said, so much of, of uh, this, uh, this legislation that comes about, and it did start with the cities. It started with Escondido and Hazleton and moved to Farmer's Branch, and Foster hit it right on when he talked about this increasing uh, sophistication, if you will, in the ways that these communities and later the states attempted to navigate their way around the Supreme Court cases and come up with these creative, I would say cynical devices to accomplish indirectly what they could not do directly. And it usually starts with a political movement. And the city of Farmers Branch has started with a very young city council member who had his eye on the mayoral office and quickly um, uh, did a study of his community and found out that, uh, and, and this was mentioned in the last panel, how demographics often drive these political movements. In the year 1990, the census in Farmers Branch showed the community then of about 25,000 people being 60 plus percent white and less than 30 percent Latino. By 2000, uh, the Latino percentage of the population had grown to 44.6, whites were 44.4, and the rest were African American. And hence, you have a city council member who, in a local magazine article, takes the reporter around and talks about how things have deteriorated in this town that he loves so much growing up, how other people have moved in, uh, people who weren't uh, uh, the kind that they wanted in their community and they needed to do something about it. This all started, like I said, it's the five-year anniversary of this legislation, and it is a labyrinth to work uh, your way uh, right around. Julia was, was right. There has been so many attempts by the city to accomplish, again, a particular goal here, and that is to drive out those forces that were changing ever so much the demographics of the city of Farmers Branch. It began with a resolution uh, which was to the effect of the Bush administration is not doing enough to enforce the federal immigration laws. And we're frustrated and we're mad and we're downright irritated. And those aren't my words. Those words were actually in the resolution. You had that populist speak. We're downright mad. It's time that we took over and took control. So it began with a resolution that had no legal impact to it, but it was a statement of a philosophy, it was a statement of a policy that the community was going to pursue, and oh, did they pursue it very quickly. English as the official language resolution came out. 
followed by uh, efforts within their community centers and recreation centers to unplug uh, Spanish language television from the cable channels. There was actually a resolution to eliminate Spanish language books from the local libraries. Now, whether that would be done through a book burning or through merely taking them on the back dock and taking them to some half-price bookstore, who knew? But that was actually one thing which thankfully didn't pass. There was another resolution that was aimed at brightly colored and decorative uh, houses and front porches that the, uh, that the people who uh, uh, were the predominant portion of the population back in the 60s and 70s somehow found offensive. We didn't come into play until a resolution, no it was passed by the city of Farmers Branch that actually was an attempt to license the right to live in the city. More specifically, to impose a licensing requirement on someone's ability to rent a house or an apartment. And of course, as you can imagine now, well, how do you get that license? Well, you prove yourself a United States citizen or that you have the authority to be lawfully present in the city of Farmers Branch. We sprung into action immediately. We were contacted by some community leaders and we were also hired by some apartment complexes that were going to be affected by this ordinance. We immediately uh, organized a grassroots movement uh, to get a door-to-door -door campaign to get signatures that would have required this ordinance to go to a public referendum. We did succeed and in, in all of us went door-to-door, -door, knocked on doors in Farmers Branch. and, and, and frankly found an interesting array and spectrum of public opinion on this issue. Uh, but again, it was all driven by the politicians. We got the referendum, it went to a vote, and I know I'm going to be off on this, Travis, but it, it passed, the ordinance passed about 60-40, which was a closer call than what the politicians said it was going to be. But nevertheless, we did not succeed in our effort to get the population to uh, vote down this ordinance. We did two things then, because at some point the, the ordinance was about to take effect, and we thought there were two problems with it. Number one, that it, it had been passed, it had been voted on, it had been devised, it had been conceived behind closed doors. And in Texas, as you do in most states, you have open meetings acts, which in Texas actually have criminal repercussions upon city council members and others who violate that act. We immediately went to state court and we sought an injunction saying that this piece of legislation, this ordinance, this licensing statute uh, was defective, it was invalid on its face because it had been conceived in private away from public scrutiny in the light of day and we got a temporary restraining order that prohibited that from taking effect. At the same time, because we didn't know what was going to happen in state court, we filed a federal court action. Uh, alleging a number of things, due process violations, that, that the ordinance violated the Equal Protection Clause, and probably most important, that it was preempted by the Supremacy Clause of the United States, because as we all know, immigration is a matter of, of federal import and federal responsibility. We didn't have to take that one to federal court because the temporary restraining order with respect to the Open Meetings Act killed the first ordinance. To Foster's point again, it doesn't stop just by getting that initial victory. What did the city do? Well, uh, empowered and supported by FAIR, uh, the Federa Federation of American Immigration and Reform, came in and rewrote the ordinance. So we have ordinance number two, which tried to adopt, and again, they get creative, tried to adopt uh, housing and urban development uh, phraseology and words and phrases and, and, and uh, uh, use those by saying, look, we merely adopt what the federal government is doing. Well, what they adopted were HUD requirements uh, with respect to public housing. And this, of course, dealt with private contractual matters, getting an apartment, renting a house within the city of Farmers Branch. We filed a suit there, so this is federal suit number two and we obtained a temporary restraining order, a preliminary injunction, and finally a permanent injunction and judgment against the city of Farmers Branch, finding that that attempt to kind of shadow the terminology within the HEB regulations
regulations. It was merely a ruse, and it ultimately boiled down to the city to determine who could live there, who was unlawfully present or lawfully present within uh, the city of Farmers Branch. Okay, victory number two, there goes ordinance number two. This was 2007, 2008 comes along. Once again, bolstered by FAIR, City of Farmers Branch comes out with ordinance number three, which essentially says, well, you tell us that we keep trying to usurp the role of the federal government. What we're going to do is punt all these determinations to the federal government. We're going to require that everyone who wants to rent a house or an apartment in the city get a license. You're automatically going to be given a license, but you have to fill out whether you're a citizen or whether you're not a citizen. If you're not a citizen, we're going to take it to the federal government. I don't know what you do. You pick up a phone and you call the federal government. I always wonder, you know, who do you contact? That's a fairly broad array of folks that you might uh, want to contact. And find out whether these people are lawfully or unlawfully present. Of course, that terminology, if you go through the SAVE program or any similar program, it will tell you the immigration status of an individual. You know, we, we do predominantly commercial litigation, trial work for businesses, entrepreneurs. But we told ourselves years ago that, you know, you have something when you're a lawyer. And it's fairly incredible. It's called the power of <coughs> bar card. And what you can do as a licensed lawyer in your state, no matter what you do during the daylight hours, you have the so-called able body. Uh, marathon runners completed their marathon. We had opportunities like that, but we had a unique opportunity come along uh, in our backyard. Our home office is in Dallas, Texas, and we have a uh, major office here in New York as well. And this past couple of months, I think, marks the fifth anniversary of the Bicklin Brewer storefronts fight against the city of Farmers Branch, Texas, and it has been an ability to make a difference. We formed about a decade ago Bitcoin Brewer Storefront, which is a subsidiary, if you will, of our law firm, that does public interest work. Through the years, we've done things like we represented the wheelchair athletes in the New York Marathon, and we're able to get the marathon opened up to uh, wheelchair athletes uh, so they weren't diverted, like in the years past, over to the side and told to stop while they... Okay. I have an immense respect for public interest lawyers, people who devote their professional careers to doing the right thing and helping people. And among other things, environmental law, civil rights matters, and the like. Bickle and Brewer is not a public interest law firm. Been quite a fight at that. Little bit of background, Farmers Branch is a not too affluent but certainly middle class, older suburb of Dallas. Population approximately 30,000 people. As Foster said, so much of, of uh, this, uh, this legislation that comes about, and it did start with the cities. It started with Escondido 